if you really want to make a difference to the health, happiness, livelihoods, wealth of people in poor countries, go for problems which are huge, neglected and tractable, and food safety is that. Food safety has been very much neglected in development. And one of the reasons is that until very recently, nobody really understood how big a problem foodborne disease was. Foodborne disease is, is one of the, the commonest sets of diseases in the world. It can cause a whole range of symptoms and syndromes. Everything from what we commonly think of as foodborne disease, things like, like vomiting or diarrhea, up to serious illnesses such as blindness, epilepsy, even death. It's only in the last decade that the first estimates were generated after a lot of effort by the World Health Organization of the extent of the health burden of foodborne disease. In trying to understand the burden of disease, it's important to have a measure which can combine both sickness and death. And the common measure which is used is something called the disability adjusted life year. It's a long phrase, but basically it just means when you add up all the death and you add up all the sickness, what is the equivalent in healthy years of life lost? The disability adjusted life years due to foodborne disease are more than 42 million, which is comparable to the burden of malaria, HIV, AIDS or TB. These diseases are sometimes called the big three. The burden of foodborne disease is not borne by everyone equally. We use an acronym called the YOPIs to summarize the most vulnerable groups, and they are the young, the old, the pregnant, and the immunosuppressed. Among these groups, children are one of the most at risk, even though globally children under the age of five years are only 9% of the population, they bear 40% of the burden of foodborne disease. The economic cost, which is usually measured in dollars, is more than $100 billion for low and middle income countries. But because the burden of foodborne disease was unknown and wrongly believed to be very low, investments in food safety have been orders of magnitude less than investments in the big three. Investing in food safety is necessary for investments in nutrition to pay off. And that's because some of the most nutritious foods, produce, fruit, green leafy vegetables, are also some of the most risky. By encouraging people to eat nutritious foods, eggs, milk, vegetables, if you're putting them at risk of getting more foodborne disease, you're investing in causing problems for yourself. Having established that foodborne disease is of the same order of magnitude as malaria, HIV, AIDS or TB, the next question is where is all this disease coming from? The great burden of foodborne disease occurs in low and middle income countries and most of this is the result of fresh food purchased from informal markets. By informal markets, sometimes called traditional markets in Southeast Asia called wet markets, we mean markets which are not modern. Public markets, open public markets, or sometimes covered public markets, where you'll find hundreds of sellers coming together to sell a range of dry goods and fresh foods. But other aspects of these informal and traditional markets are the kiosks or stalls, sometimes called mom and pop shops. These little five foot by four foot selling areas you find all over Africa and Asia. And also street food, people moving around with carts or barrows or just bowls on their heads selling food. But of course, markets vary. While some informal markets are tourist attractions because of their interest and diversity, others are more like something out of Dante's Inferno, especially those markets which are closely associated with slaughterhouses, and the slaughterhouses are often not the most modern, and the welfare and hygiene is not very good. Our challenge is how we can accentuate the positives while minimizing the negatives of these essential markets. It's quite clear that a relatively smaller number, number of hazards, maybe 10 or 20, cause a great bulk of the disease 
80% or more, and that most of these are microbes. Among the most common of these are some which have unfortunately become household names because of the outbreaks they've caused in Europe and other places. Listeria, E. coli, Campylobacter, Salmonella, so common in the poultry industry. In Africa and Southeast Asia, you still get parasitic diseases causing large problems. So in short, there is a whole range of biological and chemical causes of foodborne disease. But fortunately, if we could only tackle a relatively small number of those, we would reduce the huge burden of foodborne disease by more than 80%. We found that um, there were two common approaches. One was to provide infrastructure, but all too often when you provide infrastructure, hard skills without soft skills, it doesn't last. Maybe for the first few months, everything is nice, but with time, there is not maintenance, the infrastructure degrades, and it, things can actually end up worse. The other common approach has been training people. But too often it has just been telling people what they should do. Why? Because this is hygiene and you should be hygienic. And we know that just telling people to do things is not a very effective way at changing their behavior. So in the past decade, more sophisticated approaches have arisen to improving food safety in traditional markets. And one of these we call the three-legged stool approach. Called three-legged stool because a three-legged stool with only two legs will not stand. All three have to go together. First of all, an enabling environment. By that we mean that the authorities, the inspectors, the government officers should be on board or at least not hostile to informal markets. The second leg of the stool is training and simple technology for the vendors. Vendors, sellers in informal markets have been some of the most neglected people in developing countries. Farmers have received a lot of attention, households and consumers have received a lot of attention, but vendors truly are the missing middle who have been left out of the development plans. Because they've been left out so much though, they are a low hanging fruit and actually providing training and simple technologies to vendors can be rather effective. But, and here we come to the last leg of the three-legged stool, only if incentives are in place for behaviour change. And this has been the most ignored part of the problem of improving hygiene and safety in wet markets. What are these incentives? Well, economists sometimes categorise incentives as material, social or moral. By material, they mean getting more money for doing something or getting some other material advantage. Earning more money because people perceive you as more hygienic, cleaner. Incentives can also be social. That is, your image in the community changes. You have better relations with authority. You have better relations with your neighbor if you are seen to be selling safe food. Or even moral, by professionalizing vendors, by helping them to slowly upgrade, they get a higher sense of self-worth, they feel empowered, and this motivates them to change their behavior. In developing countries, one of the reasons food is still very unsafe is because too much has been left to the government. There's been this prominent idea that we must regulate our way and legislate our way to, to safe food. And when we look historically back to when food became safer in Europe and America during the 19th century and early 20th century, it wasn't the government who made food safer. It wasn't the businesses who made food safer. It was the consumers. It was consumer demand which changed food systems. This is very clearly the case in America where it was the book The Jungle by Upton Sinclair based in the Chicago meat yards which directly led to the founding of the Food and Drug Administration. In fact, Upton Sinclair, who was a socialist, he wrote this book as a plea for help for the terrible working conditions in the Chicago meat yards for the workers. But the effect the book had was to highlight the shocking and safe and the unsanitary food which was coming out of these meat yards. There was so much horror when people finally found out the conditions the food they were eating were produced in that public demand and public outcry changed those conditions. We're hoping to repeat this success in low and middle income countries by seeing how consumer demand for food safety can be an engine to drive up food safety in the informal markets where they buy it.
It's often said and wrongly said that poor people don't care about food safety. They do care. We've done lots of surveys and lots of studies to show that they do care. What happens is they can't always afford the safe food they want and they can't always recognize the safe food they want. The first step is in helping them recognize safe food. And the second step is when they can't have the food as safe as they can afford it, they know how to at least make the unsafe food they are sometimes forced to buy safer. We think sometimes people are making decisions without enough knowledge, and if they get more knowledge about all of the risks associated with food, and also what you can do if you're forced to buy unsafe food, and if they can be informed about these microscopic invisible germs on damaged tomatoes, which are making their children sick if they eat them, they can be persuaded to spend a little more for fewer intact tomatoes and use the cheaper damaged tomatoes in the stews. If they can learn these simple rules, they have a strong incentive for protecting themselves and their families. Foodborne disease has all the hallmarks of a priority disease. The problem is immense. Billions of people are affected every year, and it is one of the single biggest health problems. And it also affects many things outside health. So the scale is immense. Secondly, it's tractable. We've been researching food safety for quite a short time, but already we've shown that with relatively small investments, $20, $30 per vendor, we can prevent hundreds of dollars worth of disease and save lives. It's a tractable problem. And thirdly, it's neglected. Because everybody has been ignoring food safety for so long and investing in other areas, there's a huge potential to get very far, very fast, more than by investing in other areas which have had the spotlight on them for decades. I would say, if you really want to make a difference to the health, happiness, livelihoods, wealth of people, go for problems which are huge, neglected and tractable, and food safety is that.